Hello everyone, I'm Saloni Doshi, the founder and director of Space 118 and your host for today. Welcome to those who are joining in from India and other parts of the world. Thank you so much for your presence today. As many of you already know, Space 118 has been an artist studio and residency space for the past 11 years, supporting over 400 artists from India and all over the world in nearly 30 open studio days. Building on our vision of creating an ecosystem of support and dialogue for Indian and global art practitioners, we're now expanding our role into an independent grants making organization that responds to the needs and challenges of our times today. In a similar spirit of deconstructing the current time stands our latest initiative, the On Making series, which is on to its second season now. We launched the series with a simple idea to give our audiences a behind the scenes perspective into how monumental artworks and exhibitions are made by inviting their artists and curators to take us through their processes. As in residency organizer and an arts patron myself, I have very often believed that a landmark victory of putting together a great show is to get a great audience. I am happy to say that six weeks later, not only has the series generated audience from across the globe, thanks to the pandemic, but also through the art pyramid comprising of museum directors, curators, gallerists, collectors, students, and even auction houses, amongst others. It has allowed us as organizers to get a glimpse into the many facets of contemporary art practice and processes, whether it is the material concerns of those who build, the astuteness of art handlers and space designers who hang the shows, the generosity of institutions and patrons who support these projects, and last but not the least, the vision of the artist and the curator to put together these mammoth shows it has been a pleasure to bring out these aspects to the audiences, especially at a time when physically going for a show is out of bounds for many of us, and I personally miss it the most. The wide response from our viewers enables us to bring to you each week the thing to do on a Sunday. And today we're pleased to have with us a critic, curator, and art historian, Murtaza Wali. Based between Brooklyn, New York, and Sharjah, Murtaza is an adjunct curator at the Jamil Arts Center in Dubai and is currently curating a series of exhibitions on the role of architecture of the Gulf region to the lives of the people in the region at Warehouse 421 in Abu Dhabi. Murtaza is a recipient of the 2011 Creative Capital Warhol Foundation Art Writers Grant, which he contributes to regularly. And he's also a visiting instructor at the Pratt Institute, Brooklyn, and a lead tutor of Campus Art Dubai. Today, Murtaza will take us through his widely acclaimed group exhibition, Crude, which I had the privilege to see in 2019 at the inaugural show of the Jamil Art Center in Dubai. Bringing together 17 artists and collectives from the Middle East and beyond, Crude explores oil as an agent of socio-cultural transformation across the Middle East and North Africa. Oil has been a trigger for misguided colonial ventures, wars, coups, modernization and development. Oil has not only been a catalyst for nation building, but also the cause of terrible ecological disasters like oil spills. Oil and its associated industries has produced a spectrum of representations such as documents, records, plans, photographs, images, and artifacts that not only bring alive these complex histories of oil and oil trade, but this material is largely inaccessible and buried with, uh, within the archives of national and corporate media. It is the oil industries, this very nuanced and murky histories and archives that the show brings forth, thus retelling an alternative history of modernity in the Gulf. The exhibition also includes works that reflect on some of the specific technologies that are byproducts of the oil trade, from drills, bits, automobiles, to synthetic petroleum products from our daily lives and their long-term effects across the region. Last but not the least, I would like to introduce Falguni Guliani, who is our Space 118 Contemporaries 
art writer in residence and the moderator for today's Q&A. She will speak after Murtaza's um, presentation. And I welcome you all and over to you, Murtaza. Look forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Saloni, Falguni, and everybody else at Space 118 for this uh, uh, wonderful invitation to uh, uh, share my exhibition. Um, it's been a couple of years, a uh, year and a half maybe, and I thought I had finally put it to rest, but uh, like oil, it's bubbling up again. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, everybody around the world for joining in on this uh, uh, Sunday. Um, for some of you guys, those in... Uh, South Asia, it's your evening. Uh, for us here in, uh, in North America, it's early in the morning. So I very much appreciate you guys taking out a little bit of time on your day off uh, to join me. Um, so um, I'll just uh, roughly outline the way I'm gonna, uh, uh, way I've structured the presentation um, and then we will begin. Um, I'm, uh, um, I've, uh, to give you guys kind of like a sense of, for those of you who didn't get a chance to see the exhibition uh, so that you get a, get, a, uh, get a bit of a sense of what it looked like. Um, the first about 10 or 12 slides are, are uh, uh, kind of a virtual walkthrough of the, of the five rooms of the exhibition. Um, and then after that, I've, uh, I, I thought I would zero in on some of the works specifically and talk about them. Um, so, uh, just to start off with, I, I'm just going to uh, lay out some of the uh, ideas behind the exhibition. Um, this was the um, the um, display announcing the exhibition in the elevator lobby of the uh, of the Jiminy Art Center. Uh, I worked very very closely with uh, uh, a design studio out of Lebanon called Studio Suffer um, on the graphic identity of the exhibition, and they were really taken by um, uh, an idea that will come up in the exhibition as I discuss it as well, about this idea that uh, oil has this metamorphic capacity uh, to transform itself. And it also has this visual uh, quality that allows it to simultaneously be um, an absence or a void, the, the kind of like blackness uh, of it, but then also uh, simultaneously it's this reflective surface and uh, that produces this uh, 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 a spectral sheen. By spectral, I mean uh, the, the entire spectrum. Um, and so throughout the, a lot of the design elements, they picked up on this and found all of these amazing uh, materials uh, that kind of reflected this capacity of oil. Um, this is, uh, just to situate us, this is the Jamil Art Center. Crude was presented as part of its uh, inaugural uh, programming uh, when it opened in uh, November of 2018. Um, it's located on the creek, um, and uh, for any of you guys visiting Dubai or passing through Dubai uh, who haven't already been, I would say uh, definitely make take a few hours out to go see it. They're doing amazing, amazing, amazing things, and a much needed nonprofit institutional uh, space within the uh, commercially driven art scene in Dubai. Um, okay, so now turning to my exhibition. Um, I wanted to start off with a quote. Um, when I started doing research on, uh, for the exhibition, um, I tapped into a very important uh, kind of emerging discipline called energy humanities, which basically takes uh, a humanities-based approach to issues around uh, how energy uh, and how uh, fuels uh, shape uh, uh, social and cultural life and, and have impacted history as well. Um, and uh, the, the texts are, uh, you know, very revealing, uh, incredibly well written, and I could have picked from a lot of those texts, but I thought I would start with this one uh, because it's actually uh, quite uh, simple and evocatively written. It's by a, a Polish journalist named uh, Richard Kapszynski, and it is taken from um, his profile of the uh, Shah of Iran, called the Shah of Shahs. And uh, uh, Kapczynski writes, oil creates the illusion of a completely changed life. Uh, life without work, life for free. 
The concept of oil expresses perfectly the eternal human dream of wealth achieved through lucky accident, through the kiss of fortune, and not by sweat, anguish, and hard work. In this sense, oil is a fairy tale, and like every fairy tale, a bit of a lie. And um, this, the, the tension in this, or the dialectic in this last sen sentence was key for my exhibition, um, which was of course being presented in a context where oil is uh, responsible for modernity and development, not just for environmental uh, uh, kind of uh, collapse or uh, rampant consumerism. And, and so I had to explore, you know, both sides of this kind of Janus based quality that oil has, where it both has the capacity for uh, exuberance and then also for despair, where it has the capacity to both be understood as magical and uh, is insidious in the way in which it pervades uh, everyday life, uh, the way it becomes ubiquitous and it uh, penetrates all aspects of what uh, George Perry called the infraordinary and hence it assures our ongoing reliance on it. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, so these are just some shots of the exhibition, uh, just to give you some sense. Um, the, the exhibition uh, was originated from uh, a, a series of works that I, uh, I came across uh, in my research, uh, just ongoing research, not uh, specifically driven research, that um, were attempting to recapture moments from the region's uh, history and specifically its encounter, its early encounters with modernity uh, through the archive um, specifically. And so there was a very strong archival uh, look to the uh, exhibition. Um, what was interesting for me was uh, in ways that don't depend on uh, narratives of nationalism, colonialism, imperialism, and uh, conflict uh, specifically. Um, and oil seemed to provide a really interesting uh, lens through which to uh, uh, recount that. Um, uh, some of the writing about uh, in this energy humanities uh, uh, scholars, uh, they, they, come up with, they came up with this term called petro-modernity and I was really taken by this, the, uh, the idea that a material uh, produces a particular type of modernity and that, that the, the, the contours of that particular type of modernity uh, can be traced and tracked and then uh, maybe even possibly recurs and at other moments in other spaces uh, when oil is discovered and the wealth that comes with it enters into that uh, uh, national space. Um, so uh, the other interesting thing about uh, the oil industry, especially in the Gulf, is that it left behind a very, very rich uh, archive. Um, uh, the oil companies that... Uh, so oil was first found, discovered within the region around the, around the, uh, the, the Gulf um, in 1908 in uh, southwestern Iran. Um, and very quickly, um, uh, Western companies started kind of coming in and uh, uh, figuring out ways of uh, um, uh, tapping into those resources. Uh, uh, about uh, a decade and a half later, it was uh, discovered in Iraq and then subsequently in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, and then eventually in uh, um, the UAE and Iran as well. Uh, I mean, uh, UAE and Oman as well. Um, and what was interesting about these companies is that uh, uh, on one hand, their uh, presence in the region um, um, entangled uh, the history of oil with the histories of, uh, of colonialism and imperialism, but uh, um, it, like I said, also produced this large and rich archive that we can now access. And these artists who kind of were the seeds of this exhibition uh, were uh, tapping into this archive. Um, um, what was the, the reason why these companies produced these archives was twofold. On one hand, they had to uh, basically justify their foreign uh, adventures to their stakeholders back home. Um, and that material, basically propaganda material, corporate propaganda material was then also trickled down 
to uh, the societies that they were uh, that the companies were located in uh, as pedagogical tools for people to learn about uh, these faraway places. Um, so for the Anglo uh, Iranian oil company and for I, the Iraqi petroleum company, it was about the Middle East. But um, um, for um, in Holland, yeah, it was about Indonesia and Dutch shells operations in Southeast Asia um, and uh, things like that. But what, what, the other thing that was really quite fascinating about this archive is that the archive was not just uh, documents. It was actually also um, consisted of a lot of visual material. Because like I said, this was all corporate propaganda and they had to produce uh, visual to go along with all of the uh, text. So there were um, of, uh, extensive photography. Some of it was, of course, survey photography for the purposes of oil, uh, oil prospecting. But then some of it was just uh, a way of demonstrating the, the positive effects that oil was having um, uh, around the world, but specifically in the countries that they were in. This particular quality of oil uh, was used extensively um, as nationalist movements started taking hold within uh, the Middle East as a way of justifying the presence of these foreign companies within the, the, the nation state. Um, so in 1953, uh, or in the uh, early 1950s, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh uh, pushed to nationalize the oil industry in Iran and basically kick out uh, the company that now is BP. Um, and in response to that, a lot of these uh, uh, oil companies and these visual prop these propaganda departments that were associated with them uh, started uh, producing material that catered uh, to the local um, and specifically to uh, the uh, uh, Arabic and Persian speaking populations. Um, and so the, the 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 that's that's some background, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll come to the other kind of uh, um, main kind of focus areas of the exhibition uh, as we get to them a, a little bit later. Uh, but um, this first body of work is, uh, I've, I've kind of lumped it under a heading called uh, Company Men. And it's basically uh, engaging with this archival material. And, uh, but it's engaging with this archival material through artwork. Uh, uh, there's very little work in the exhibition that is actual um, archival material. Uh, it's almost all, um, uh, mediated through and uh, through the artists' works themselves. Um, the exhibition, as I started researching it, revealed itself to be, the subject matter revealed itself to be uh, simultaneously something surprisingly that hadn't been done, but also that was vast. And uh, I did toy with the idea of actually including archival material within the exhibition itself, but there just wasn't enough room. And so I decided to uh, let the archive emerge organically through the engagement that these artists had with the archive. So just to go through a few works that uh, kind of uh, engage with the archive, um, I call it Company Men because it engages with uh, the kind of some of the uh, behaviors and, uh, uh, and practices that uh, were associated with uh, the oil companies uh, activities within uh, Iran and Iraq especially. Um, but more, uh, but also in other parts of the Gulf, in uh, Aramco as well. Um, so this, uh, I what what was interesting about this um, kind of uh, need to produce visuals, uh, kind of uh, convincing uh, the public, both at home and in 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 the in the countries that they were prospecting in, that uh, what they were doing was valuable, is that it also forced an engagement with local creatives. And uh, so you, I found at least uh, two uh, examples of artists who, or, uh, who worked for the oil companies to help produce this visual material, uh, who were also artists in their own right. Um, and so I thought it was important as a starting off point uh, to include these images. I mean, the, in some sense, their, um, their practices were driven literally by uh, the, um, expansion and the modernity that oil enabled. Uh, so these two works are by um, an Iraqi photographer named Latif Alani, who worked uh, uh, for the Iraqi petroleum company in the late, uh, uh, in the 50s, um, in the early 50s. 
and he uh, was trained as a photographer at the, as part of the uh, uh, company's uh, PR team. And uh, he would photograph for their magazine. They put out these magazines, uh, as did the uh, uh, oil company in Iran and in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and all of those uh, places as well. And uh, but then he also uh, took photographs on his own, and he continued to photograph as um, the the main photographer for the ministry, Iraqi Ministry of Culture uh, until the late 70s, when uh, the kind of growing influence of Saddam uh, and uh, um, he perceived a threat from that and then kind of withdrew. Uh, but what's amazing about his photographs is that they kind of captured the, the throes of, uh, uh, of uh, oil modernity, uh, of petrol modernity, the, the kind of uh, uh, profound transformations of, uh, of society and space uh, and cities um, and social life that happen as a result of the discovery of oil. So, and his photographs are also, they're, they're black and white largely and they're formally uh, uh, striking. Um, so the work on the left is uh, um, from uh, the construction of a dam in, uh, in Kurdistan, in Northern Iraq. Uh, and um, I, I liked it because it also brings to mind the, the pipeline, which I will come back to in a little bit later, the oil pipeline. But it also uh, reveals how uh, the revenue that comes in from oil kind of produces an infrastructural development that uh, extends beyond just that specific industry. Um, the work on the right is actually a view of a, of a modernist housing project in, in Baghdad as well. Um, uh, some of the revenue that was being uh, generated by oil um, in the 40s and the 50s in, in Iraq was then used to kind of transform uh, Iraqi cities from these kind of medieval Arab uh, spaces. Uh, of narrow alleyways and twisting and turn, twists and turns into kind of modern city, what we imagine as modern cities, um, and so uh, you know a lot of um, uh, major modernist architects um, and urban planners from Walter Gropius to Constantine Doxiadis uh, were brought in to kind of transform uh, uh, Baghdad and other uh, urban spaces in Iraq, kind of the in the same way that Lake Corbusier was brought in to uh, design Chandigarh. Um, and this uh, neighborhood in, in Baghdad is uh, exemplary of that. I also included this, uh, this image specifically in the exhibition because um, it captures another aspect of, uh, of modernity, which is this kind of uh, uh, repetitive serial uh, logic that uh, emerges from uh, uh, the, the kind of industrial rhythms of the, of the factory um, and uh, tra translated into space. Um, I also, my research also revealed one other uh, kind of company man, um, and uh, he was an Iranian painter named uh, Hushang Pezeshnia. And uh, what was interesting about uh, Hushang Pezeshnia is that um, he was actually trained as an artist. He went to art school in, in Turkey, uh, but when he came back to uh, Iran uh, uh, to support himself, he started working at the oil company. And again, he worked in the oil company's PR department, uh, producing illustrations. Um, uh, a lot more uh, historical research needs to be done to figure out precisely what other things he was doing for them. Uh, but I, I do know that he produced illustration. And what was striking for me is that as influential as oil was uh, in this uh, mid-century moment, mid-20th century moment within the Middle East, it doesn't seem to appear that much in artwork. And his, is, uh, his was one of the rare instances where I actually found an artist who was producing work representing uh, the labor of oil. Uh, of course, it was also important for me to show images of the people who work in this, in this industry because they are largely like the industry itself and like the material itself and like the infrastructure, they're largely invisible. Um, they are, we, we cannot ac uh, uh, access them. It was also very important for me uh, curating a show in the context of Dubai to include representations of labor because the representations of labor are a, a, a kind of a contested topic in that social space as well. Um, so this is actually a work that showed um, in, a, in a show called Iran Modern. That's where I first saw it in, at the Asia Society in, in, in New York. And uh, you know, it, 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 it demonstrates both the kind of like the dignity and the nobility of these uh, laborers, although they were often working uh, under uh, very uh, dire uh, circumstances and living conditions. 
And that's a whole sub story of the exhibition that we won't have time to go into, but the ways in which these uh, uh, foreign companies basically recreated colonial logics, both spatially and socially um, in the company towns that they developed in, in the region, uh, in and around uh, either oil fields or refineries. Um, so this is this shifts the focus away from uh, uh, the northern Gulf to the the southern Gulf. This is a, a work by Hajra Wahid. Uh, this was one of three commissioned works for the exhibition, um, and it's called uh, the ARD Study for a Portrait, and it was a 28 part work uh, that also delved in the archives of uh, specifically of a uh, division within Aramco called the Arab Research Division. And uh, the division was uh, ostensibly uh, meant to do about geological and uh, uh, social and cultural research. It was uh, uh, filled with uh, uh, area study scholars, Near Eastern study scholars, Arabic scholars, um, and uh, anthropologists uh, who were all uh, American trained. Um, but it also had this relationship with uh, uh, post-war and wartime and post-war espionage. And uh, what's interesting about this project is that it, it kind of uh, um, brings that archive, which has otherwise been relatively hidden out, but then what it also traces is some of the other nefarious activities that this division was involved in, uh, which um, include uh, surveillance of uh, labor unrest. So if the if Pezeshnia's work was like uh, representing labor, uh, what happens through the history of oil in the region also is this kind of um, antagonism between the the laboring uh, uh, body and the, the the kind of corporate colonial masters. And um, initially, the, the 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 these companies, these corporate uh, entities, uh, were actually quite extractive and manipulative, and took a lot of advantage of. Uh, not just the local landscape, but also the, the local labor resources. And it was only through a back and forth of uh, labor agitation and then concession and then uh, labor agitation and then concession that uh, the, these lab uh, uh, the, labor, uh, the laborers who uh, toiled within these industries uh, managed to improve their, uh, their conditions. Um, and this work kind of uh, uh, references that through a series of photographs that have this surveillance-like quality uh, of uh, uh, protests and labor uh, unrest uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then uh, I was also, this was actually one of the early works that uh, inspired the exhibition. Um, it's by a Dubai based artist named Raja Khaled. And um, uh, like I was saying, these, uh, uh, these uh, companies all produced this rich visual material. And uh, uh, I'm sure. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with Aramco magazine, which is kind of like uh, 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 valued across uh, across the globe for uh, the the kind of depth and uh, complexity of the coverage that it provides of uh, social and cultural uh, aspects of the uh, of the Middle East. But uh, it's important to remember that it is it was one of these uh, kind of PR tools and. Uh, uh, Raja Khaled actually mined this archive, uh, an archive both of uh, magazines, uh, of primarily Western magazines during the mid century uh, to look for traces of, uh, uh, of Arabian oil within them. Uh, and uh, uh, out of a larger body of work that also includes other aspects, um, what I was quite fascinated with was uh, these images of people playing golf, uh, which to me, uh, feel a lot like the Arabian version of uh, uh, the Brits playing uh, cricket in India. Um, you know, a golf in the middle of a sandy desert seems completely uh, counterintuitive. Um, and their kind of like stubborn need to hold on to it and impose it on the landscape, uh, I thought was quite fascinating. And then the fact that it has a history that goes back about 50 years, I found even more uh, 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 breathtaking. Um, the the interest in this was inspired by an early uh, encounter that I had in the 1990s, uh, before Dubai had developed to the degree that it has now, of landing into Dubai and seeing this patch of pristine green in the middle of the sandy desert. Uh, and then when I landed, realizing that it was the newly built uh, Dubai golf course. And 
just the incredul incredulity of uh, having a perfectly manicured green lawn in the middle of the sandy, hot sandy desert and the amount of uh, energy expenditure that, and water, water use that's required to maintain that uh, just blew me away. And, and, and this project uh, specifically kind of revealed um, the origins of it, you know, that uh, this, this interest in, in golfing in a, in a region that's completely inhospitable to it uh, is uh, embedded within an earlier moment of colonialism. Um, and then uh, this is a uh, this is a video work by Alessandro Balteo Yazbek, um, in collaboration with Media Farzine called Chronoscope. Um, and if the first two works that I showed within the selection of works were about people from these countries, uh, 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 nationals of these countries who were taken up within the oil and uh, oil uh, company uh, structures, um, and uh, asked to represent their own nation states. Uh, th these latter two, three works are about uh, the com company men as colonizers in some sense. And, um, and this particular work, uh, you know, Balteo Yazbek and Farzin um, discovered a, a, a TV program from the early 1950s called Chronoscope, which was a current events program that aired on uh, American television. And, um, in and around the 1950s, they found a whole series of conversations that were uh, in response basically to the nationalization of oil uh, in Iran and the anxieties that that produced within the West. And what they did was they took a whole series of these uh, uh, conversations, which almost, which the format was that there was one kind of uh, Guest and then two journalists were the interlocutors who who, who interacted with the, with that person. Um, they took a whole bunch of episodes and then uh, created a script that blended them seamlessly, so that it seems like one large uh, kind of group conversation or a panel or even possibly uh, uh, a court case. And what's quite amazing about this is the, just the, the the level of uh, detachment that these men have from the from the parts of the world that they're extracting from you know the the concerns that they have are all uh literally linked to themselves uh their politics and their profit uh what's also intriguing about this work is that as you watch it you realize that the people who are involved in politics and the people who are involved in the corporate structures of these companies are often the same people um so when people say that you know um um Western uh, influence within the region is all about oil. Um, this is kind of gives you proof of that, literally, where the 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 ties, you know, that between say Bush and Cheney and Halliburton or Bush and oil companies are kind of murky and shadowy in the in the early two thousands. In the nineteen fifties, nobody was trying to hide it. It was it was explicit. It's stated in their bios. And then finally, um, because I showed these Western company men, I also wanted to uh, uh, reflect the other side of it. And this was a work by a Saudi artist named Manal al Dawayan called If I Forget You, Don't Forget Me. And uh, al Dawayan grew up in, uh, in uh, 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 Dahran um, in the Aramco compound. And, and this work kind of basically is a, is a testament to a whole generation of, of Saudis who worked for Aramco from the 60s onwards, 50s, 60s onwards, uh, who were uh, aging and who were being forgotten. And uh, a lot of these people, uh, uh, Dawayan's own father worked within the company and a lot of these, uh, the figures that, who she kind of uh, memorializes through these uh, portraits that are composed of, uh, of mementos and uh, archival photographs and archival documents uh, are basically just a, 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 a monument to their contributions. Okay, so the next section I, I, I wanted to turn to a little bit was the notion of infrastructure. Um, and one of the other things that oil produces as a, as a kind of a material force uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, as a material and an agential force that produces certain types and structures of modernity, the other one is the infrastructure. To get oil out of the ground and then to distribute it to where it's consumed, uh, requires it requires a vast infrastructural network. Uh, but as I was doing the research, what became uh, quite uh, evident to me was that this infrastructure 
remains invisible. Like we don't, we consume oil, but we don't have any clear sense of where it comes from. Unless we live in the rural hinterland where we're close to the sites of extraction or to the sites of refinement. Uh, actually, in some sense, the industry consciously and actively keeps its infrastructure uh, away from the main sites of consumption so that in some sense, we're not reminded of the deleter deleterious costs of this extractive industry. And so I wanted to kind of uh, uh, reintroduce us in some sense to the infrastructure of oil, uh, but wanted to keep this kind of like invisibility or uh, distance that, um, that exists around it uh, in play. Um, so I'll just take you through a few projects. This was actually one of the earliest works um, that I thought of including in the exhibition. So in some sense was important as the, as the seed and the origin of the exhibition. It's by uh, Ryan Tabet and it's called The Shortest Distance Between Two Points. And it's an abstraction that uh, uncovers the history of uh, the tap line, which was uh, uh, an important uh, pipeline that was uh, constructed by a consortium of American oil companies that were operating in Eastern Saudi Arabia. From the oil fields in Eastern Saudi Arabia, all the way to uh, a terminal point on the Mediterranean at, uh, in Lebanon. Um, and the, the impetus for creating the pipeline was actually uh, because uh, the only other way to get to Europe uh, and North America was to go around the Arabian Peninsula and through the Suez Canal uh, uh, through tanker. And that was becoming prohibitively expensive um, as uh, tensions were rising between uh, uh, the Egyptian nationalists and the imperial powers in, of uh, US and, uh, and Britain. There was also actually some uh, infighting between the Brits and the Americans over the Suez Canal as well. And so as a way to keep costs down, they, the, the companies, the, this consortium of oil companies started this independent entity called Tapline, uh, called, which is a short form for Trans-Arabian Pipeline, which was meant to go over land. And uh, Tabet's whole project is very much about how uh, the shortest distance between two lines, is, uh, between two points is actually a straight line rather than this curve around. Um, and how that uh, uh, is imposed on the landscape. It's an abstract geometric entity that's imposed on the landscape, uh, but it transforms the landscape through its effects as well. Uh, so his works are, uh, in the exhibition were very much defined by this kind of like strong linear quality. And the two works that we included in the exhibition were these rings that are now have been shown a lot and are, are very well known. Um, each one symbolizes one kilometer within the pipeline uh, and each one is geotagged with that location. But the, the otherwise the dimensions, the perimeter, the, the area of the pipeline and the material that it's made out of are identical to the actual original pipeline. Uh, so in some sense, you get the scale version. You get to come close to it and see how small and insignificant in some sense the pipeline is. Uh, you can also walk between it, uh, peer into it, peer through it. Uh, it basically gives you an, an intimacy with the, with the spatial dynamics of the, of the pipeline. That otherwise, because they're securitized, you can't get access. In some cases, they're even buried underground. Um, and on the left, um, you know, uh, the project was inspired by uh, Tabet's discovery of, uh, of the Tapline offices in Lebanon that had been abandoned. And while he was... Uh, poking around there, he discovered all of this weathered letterhead from when the uh, the company was still operational. And so on the left, you see a line of this weathered lever letterhead. Uh, this is just to give you a close up. Um, and this serves as kind of an uh, an artifactual trace as uh, opposed to an archival. And actually the project kind of really uh, uh, intertwines the two of these. Hopefully this is something we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in the Q&A. Uh, this is a work by a collective called GCC, and uh, it turns the, the kind of like ubiquitous, but again, completely inaccessible visually uh, uh, oil extraction platform. Uh, it uh, reproduces it out of glass and gold, uh, which on one hand, again, this idea of ghosts. So uh, visually, it's kind of a, a liminal, but it also kind of cues us into the, the rituals or cultures of, of corporate life within these companies. Uh, and it, uh, this series of works was meant to mimic these kind of uh, uh, 
trophies that are given as uh, uh, to acknowledge the milestones of people who were uh, uh, in corporations. And, uh, and so there was an interesting echo between this work and the sorts of mementos that uh, are pictured in Aldo Wayan's work. Um, this one was of course more performative and ironic and wry and poking fun at that culture. Um, this was another work that uh, kind of was conjuring up ghosts um, and was also uh, uh, visually and materially uh, uh, like liminal or spectral um, by Michael John Whelan. It was called Aqualung. This was another one of the, the commissioned works. Um, and um, he discovered that uh, uh, a, a little interesting tidbit of, uh, of, of local history that I did not know beforehand. Uh, where apparently Jacques Cousteau was commissioned by the uh, uh, by the by BP, which was at that point the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, which was also had an interest in the Trucial States, um, to uh, do an underwater survey of the waters off of the coast of Abu Dhabi. Um, and um, some people, uh, it, it's it's. A little debated, but people say that that survey, the results of that survey, are what led to the discovery of Abu Dhabi's some of Abu Dhabi's earliest and and largest offshore oil deposits. So, in some sense, this this figure who then goes on to become the 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 kind of father of maritime conservation was very early on in his life implicated in uh, uh, an extractive economy that uh, is then producing uh, significant destruction of primarily those ecosystems. And uh, so what, uh, what uh, Michael John Whelan did was he, he worked with divers to um, extract sand from the seabed at some of these sites from this original 1953 survey. And uh, he um, melted them down and, uh, into glass and then he produced these blown glass objects. And the form of these glass objects, uh, each one was formed within uh, a, a, a diving tank. Uh, you know the air tank for uh, used by divers, and um, uh, the, the the reason for that form was, uh, of course, to kind of evoke the his his own process, both both his process, but then also Cousteau's survey in an abstract way. But also another thing that Jacques Cousteau was known for was uh, he's he's uh, uh, thought of uh, or he's uh, wanted as a one of the discoverers of, uh, of basically scuba diving technology, what's called aqualung. Um, and that may have been one of the reasons why he was conscripted to do this survey. Um, and, and, you know, so that comes up. And then uh, each, each work was hand blown by a, a master a glass blower in, in close um, uh, uh, conjunction with, uh, with Whelan. And what's also interesting is that, you know, from, from object to object, uh, the surface and the transparency uh, uh, is very different. And the process of both the blowing and the uh, uh, firing traps little uh, um, bubbles within the forms. And so in some sense, it evokes that uh, phenomenological experience of breathing underwater and this kind of constant bubbling of, uh, of, of breath out. Um, and finally, uh, very quickly before I turn to the next section, uh, I wanted to bring up these two works by another Dubai-based artist named Lantian Shea. Um, and it's uh, the title of the work is Chicago Beach Hotel. And it's these two very kind of like spectral uh, colored pencil drawings of, uh, of a structure uh, that at least on the right, you can clearly see the label Chicago Beach Hotel. And um, this may not they may not have any significance for people uh, who aren't familiar with the history of Dubai, but the Chicago Beach Hotel in Dubai was actually a, um, a very, uh, holds a very special place uh, for people who grew up in the 80s and the 90s. At that point in time, Dubai was not the, the, the kind of neoliberal cosmopolitan space it is now. And this was one of the few kind of spaces of that sort of cosmopolitan modernity. It, will, it also sits where, it also used to sit where now the Burj Al Dubai, a uh, Burj Al Arab, which is a, a kind of like an icon or of the brand of Dubai, um, uh, now sits. Uh, it was actually torn down and in, so that the Burj Al Dubai, uh, Burj Al Arab could be erected. Um, but uh, what's also interesting about that history and what relates to, to the exhibition is that the, the, that hotel and the beach that it sat on got, got its name from the fact that it was the launching point uh, for these huge underwater oil tanks called Khazans, 
that were built on that beach by the Chicago uh, Bridge and Ironwork Company. And so that's where it got its name from. And uh, what's interesting about that moment is that it is a moment of uh, optimism within Dubai's history because uh, Dubai finds uh, these offshore reserves and starts uh, getting energized uh, by the promise of petrol modernity, but that that promise uh, falls short. The the reserves don't end up being as significant as people may have uh, uh, people first thought, and um, very quickly Dubai has to kind of shift tracks. And what it does is it puts an emphasis on 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 trade, on uh, uh, on finance, on service, and uh, which allows Dubai to then become the the kind of like a cosmopolitan city that it is today. So in some sense, this work really marked that uh, th threshold. Um, and what the artist does here is that, you know, rather than kind of get caught up in a, in, in a, in a nostalgic um, uh, kind of move um, for this now lost monument to a kind of 80s Dubai, what he does is he chooses to kind of evoke its history through a surrogate. And so the, the images are off the a Chicago Beach Hotel in Chicago that was erected in the late 1800s uh, for uh, the World's Fair that was happening there. Uh, and again, another structure that existed and has been destroyed. Um, okay, so the next section I want to talk about really briefly is the idea of magic and horror, which picks up on uh, Kapshunsky's, um, the, the dialectic in Kapshunsky's uh, original quote. Um, this capacity of oil to both be a fairy tale and a lie in some sense. Um, so this work is um, uh, was a video by Munir Al Qadri called "Behind the Sun," which was uh, composed of uh, archival material. The the visuals were uh, footage that was shot by um, an amateur Kuwaiti journalist who, when the oil fires that Iraqi troops set in the Kuwaiti oil fields as they retreated uh, started happening. He basically got into his car, drove out to the oil fields, and shot this footage uh, on, on a VHS camera. And uh, the audio component is taken from the archives of uh, uh, Kuwaiti television. And it's basically this very uh, uh, baritone uh, and powerful recitation of, uh, of, of Sufi verses in, uh, in, in Arabic uh, that were a, a very uh, prominent feature of uh, of television in Kuwait, but then also in the United Arab Emirates in the 80s. Um, so I'm just gonna play a short clip just so that you guys can get some sense of, uh, of, the, uh, of the film. And, and then I'll come back and talk about it a little bit more. Sorry. Okay, so I'm, I'm such a brief say, uh, uh, excerpt, but I couldn't find uh, uh, a larger excerpt. But um, what's interesting about that film is that uh, the 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 audio transforms uh, um, this this these images that are very strongly associated with this kind of uh, post-war horror and environmental destruction, and it kind of uh, embeds this divine quality on them. The the Sufi verses that are uh, being recited are very much about how one can find traces of the divine within the natural world. And so in some sense, it takes the, uh, the horror of the oil fire and it uh, makes it magical. 
Um, and it reminded me of uh, kind of the, the, the ritual uh, presence that uh, fire plays within Zoro Zoroastrian uh, traditions. And it's interesting that uh, Baku, Azerbaijan, which is considered to be uh, the origins of, uh, of Zor Zoroastrianism, is also one of the um, earliest sites outside of the West where oil was discovered. And there's a very early Lumiere Brothers film that documents oil fires at these wells in Baku. So uh, Munir El Qadri, who's a Kuwaiti artist, has produced a series of works that kind of like engage with this magical quality of, uh, of oil. Um, this is a, a, a work by her that um, uses the design of oil drills that are used to kind of break through the ground and tap into the resources. And in this particular work called Orb Orbit, she's turned it into this levitating, magical levitating uh, object that floats about an inch, inch and a half uh, above uh, the plinth. She's also used it, uh, produced in different scales. So the works on the top right are, are another work from this body um, called Flower Drill. Um, and for me, these flowers, uh, I mean, by bringing out the, the, the kind of like floral quality of some of these designs, um, it's kind of an, in, an indication or a prognostication of our kind of dystopic future where um, all, of our, uh, all of our natural life will be replaced uh, by uh, or polluted by or destroyed by oil. Uh, this is another work in that, in that vein that is simultaneously dystopic, but I also find a little utopic. Uh, it creates this uh, kind of an ecology, of, uh, an unexpected ecology between uh, uh, crude oil, which is in the pan. It, it, it's by an artist named uh, Lydia O'Rahmane called Land of the Sun. So there's um, a layer of oil in the, in the pan, and then uh, you, you see this uh, uh, lemon tree that's growing out of a, uh, out of a tire. And, uh, and um, on one hand, one could view it as dystopic, like this is our future if we can continue to pollute. Um, but then in some sense, it's also a testament to the resilience of Mother Nature, that even after we have destroyed ourselves with all of these fossil fuels, uh, nature will still find a way to survive and, 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 and come back. Um, okay, so the last section very quickly um, is a section that I'm calling Plastic Petrotopia. And this is very much about how one understands the exact nature or texture of petro modernity within the UAE. So the UAE oil is found much later. It's found post-war as compared to the rest of the Gulf where it's found pre-war. Um, and the nation state doesn't become... Uh, it, it, the nation doesn't become come into being until the early 70s. And so it seemed like as I was doing research for the exhibition and trying to figure out how to situate it within its context, uh, within its immediate context, uh, this sort of archival uh, engagement that I was finding in other parts of the Middle East didn't seem to exist bar uh, Raja Khalid and uh, Munir al Qadri's work. But what I did notice was um, um, a, a, a rich seam of work that was engaging with other ways in which oil kind of penetrates uh, social life and especially this infraordinary. So I chose to, to focus on two uh, specific strains, uh, what I call the subjectivities and materialities that oil produces and specifically on plasticity and on, uh, uh, on automobility. So this was a work by uh, the, the Imarati uh, uh, pioneer Hassan Sharif called Slippers and Wires produced in 2009. And these objects which kind of transform um, uh, commodities uh, purchased, uh, cheap commodities purchased in local bazaars, and um, he kind of cuts them up and then ties them together and then piles them into these, uh, these, uh, these large uh, forms, um, was you know, consciously a critique of consumerism. But it is a, also a critique of a particular type of consumerism and at a particular speed or, uh, of consumerism that is impossible without uh, the, the kind of uh, energy surplus of oil. Uh, this is just a detail. Uh, again, you know, I was very interested in labor uh, and I was also very interested in kind of having, producing an exhibition that on one hand appealed to a lot of different types of people. So archive and video kind of can turn young viewers off, but I thought having these material uh, objects that also were very co colorful and some, were operating at the level of, of the scale of a, of a toy or an object uh, would also be a way of kind of enticing younger viewers. Uh, so that was intentional. Another intention, and we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later in the Q&A, 
was that I didn't want to represent oil in the way people expected it. So I wanted to focus on its metamorphosis, its capacity for metamorphosis and transformation into uh, plastics, into uh, uh, synthetic textiles, into this kind of uh, spectrum of not natural colors. Uh, both the expansion of material possibilities and, and, and chromatic possibilities that we live with now uh, through our kind of uh, the, uh, the, the cons consumer lifestyles that we have now are entirely impossible without oil in some sense, which uh, both allows for the production of polyesters, but also the petrochemical industry then produces uh, raw materials that allow for the production of synthetic dyes. Um, these are two works by Raja Khalid that kind of touch on two of these uh, on, on this aspect as well uh, that are but then also open up to like a critique of uh, uh, of uh, the the abstraction or the instrumentalization of uh, of natural light as national symbol, but also a symbol for uh, the oil industry and the falcon. And on the left, uh, relate to kind of uh, the dominance of car culture within Gulf societies as well. And I'll just end with these last two works by Lantian Shea, which also touch on this notion of what I call automobility within the Gulf. So one of the social and spatial uh, products of uh, oil is the um, um, uh, a growing reliance on automobility, on the production of what uh, what uh, Stephanie Lemanger called uh, petrotopias, and these petrotopias are, in some sense, the prototype for uh, Gulf cities, and where you know uh, public transport until recently has been very limited, and everybody relies on their cars and. And uh, uh, she picks up on these um, and, you know, the work on the left is a, a work that he does, a, a everyday performance uh, called Patrol, where he drives around this, uh, his car, which is this very specific retro styled SUV. Um, and it kind of indexes the, the, the SUV obsessed youth culture of the Gulf. On the right was a, another commissioned work where we gave him the most VIP spot in the Jamil Art Center's uh, underground parking garage, um, basically giving the VIP um, privileges to the kind of liminal figure of the artist. And I just want to end on this work. This is a, a another piece by him uh, called Roast Beef and Cheddar, Hot Dog and Superstar, um, which references the kind of uh, uh, pervasive influence of fast food within uh, uh, culture in the UAE uh, with, and across the Gulf. Another uh, kind of culinary behavioral pattern that is enabled by automobiles and the drive-through. And, um, uh, and I think I'll leave it there and then hopefully we can touch on some of this stuff, uh, uh, build on some of this stuff in the Q&A. Um, thank you very much. And over to you, Falgini. I was just thanking Murtuza for that walkthrough that he just took us through uh, about a show that really could not be more prescient, both in terms of its subject matter and the curatorial approach, Murtuza, that you take in presenting and putting forth this innovative material reading of a substance like crude oil, which has shaped the histories and cultures of so many regions. And as I start to take questions from the audience here, I'll ask them to put them in the chat box. I want to go back, Murtaza, to the very first segment of your presentation, which is the section about archival memorabilia. And the reason I want to start there before jumping into any of the crude specificities is because it's a question I want to ask uh, curators of, who deal with, all curators who deal with archival material, uh, especially in your case, if we look at a work uh, like the letterheads of Ryan Tabet, you know, and the choice that you make a with allowing for this organic emergence of archive and B to allow this emergence to happen through material rather than through image. Is this a conscious decision or is it a circumstantial choice on your part? And, you know, how do you think between material and image lens you know, between these two things, how do they lend themselves better over the other when you're presenting an archival work? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really, really great question. And it was something that was quite conscious in my mind. I mean, I, uh, as a historian, I, I, I engage with archives uh, regularly, but I am often frustrated with archives within an exhibitionary 
space. Uh, I find them to be quite uh, exhausting and I don't find exhibitions necessarily to be the uh, best format in which to engage with an archive. With an archive, you need to be able to sit at a desk and look through it and be able to read through it. Um, I'm, I also respond quite strongly to objects uh, and I think of images as objects rather than images per se. And, um, and so when it came to how one uh, reproduced this archive within the exhibition, I knew I wanted it to be uh, with artifacts, you know? So I wanted uh, the archive not just to be a source of information, be it textual or visual, but also be um, kind of a repository, a material repository for history itself. And, and you picked up on, on, on Ryan Tabet's letterheads that I think exemplify that for me, you know, that uh, this, this kind of uh, yellowed weather, a let, letterhead in some sense holds the residue of history, uh, literally. Uh, you know, my partner is also an archeologist, so I'm also quite attuned to the poetics of, uh, of an artifact of digging something up and letting it uh, speak on its own uh, as well. So uh, yeah, so that was the way I approached it. It also became very clear I didn't have the, the time needed or the, um, the, uh, uh, the space uh, to really do a, uh, an in-depth archival engagement. And, uh, and so I decided to instead approach it through these artworks themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's really beautiful, you know, this uh, let's, having an artifact and letting it speak. And from there, I want to go into, you know, this, um, this aspect of the material nature of oil and the dialectical contradiction in it, which you mentioned. In fact, you start your presentation with that, you know, about how oil is at once a fairy tale and a lie. It's exuberance and despair. It's magical and it's insidious. So it's this material that holds together these opposites. And, you know, we've spoken about this, about how oil on the one hand is this essential fuel for capitalist modernity. It's kind of become the face of an unrelenting expansion that has characterized our age. But at the same time, it's also something that's hidden in plain sight. I mean, in this country, we bicker about the rising prices of oil on a daily basis, but its ubiquity is also the reason that we take it for granted. You know, it's, it's a part of our daily life, but we don't see it. And if I go in from that practical aspect, aspect into then a more aesthetic stand, you know, I'm reminded of say, Amitav Ghosh's sort of landmark essay, Petrofiction, where he's talking about how in the creative universe, there's really lack of documentation or record of aesthetic encounters with oil, you know? And that was in the 1990s when he wrote this essay. And if we think about now in terms of say, the, the, the relationship between oil and say global financial capital, uh, you, you probably didn't show this work in, in your presentation, but I know that uh, Alessandro Bal Balteo Yazbek and his work the last oil barrel, which references the New York Stock Exchange is something that speaks about that relationship. So more and more, it seems this substance, which is oil, it, it's capable of holding these opposites together and is entering a realm of representation, which is increasingly nebulous. So my question is, as a curator, how do you deal with a material which you know, is everywhere, but resists representation. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, you know, for me, um, the, it was important to kind of acknowledge this duality, which actually I learned about from engaging with these, uh, with these energy humanities scholars. And, and energy humanities as a discipline, I mean, some people say that it originates from that incredibly prescient uh, Amitav Ghosh uh, review of Abdul Rahman Manif's uh, Cities of Salt. Um, and uh, um, the way I engaged with it uh, was that uh, I very consciously resisted uh, hegemonic narratives or approaches. And for me, the two main hegemonies, one was, uh, you know, recounting uh, 
a, a history through either economics or geopolitics or conflict, uh, because that's how oil often is represented. Um, to uh, resist uh, the desire to um, engage in what's, what some scholars have called the oil curse, where the sudden revenue generated by oil creates all of these kind of conduits to authoritarianism. Um, uh, and then, so, th so that was one hegemonic kind of approach that I was trying to resist. Instead, I was you know, trying to show the ways in which it's produced a certain type of history, a certain type of modernity that has both possibility in it, but also uh, the possibility of collapse. And then the other hegemony that I was trying to resist was oil's uh, materiality itself. It is an incredibly tactile, sed seductive kind of uh, uh, approach. Uh, there was one student that I was uh, uh, speaking to about the exhibition who said that she remembers like oil, like sludge washing up on the shore, shores of Kuwait once uh, when she was at the beach and how she wanted to reach out and touch it, like it wanted to be touched. And, and so that was something that I kind of really focused on. I was very careful about not including oil itself in the exhibition. Uh, so I, back, I, I, I did, I, it only really exists as, a media, as an actual material in that one case where it forms this light pool uh, in, the, in the plant work. Uh, otherwise, even black and white appears very little, but it appears when it does appear as black and white, as traces of the archive. Or in one other case, it kind of is the color that dominates the, the object in the presentation. But, uh, but otherwise, you know, I just, I wanted to include uh, its opposite. So, uh, you know, if oil is liquid, I wanted to have uh, physical objects. If oil is black, I wanted to include colorful objects. If oil is opaque, I wanted to include uh, transparent objects. Um, and this was sort of quite intentional on my part. I mean, there were other works I could have included that were more illustrative. Um, and those are often the crowd pleasers because people, you, you can't touch this stuff. And so people want to touch it. I mean, there were so many people who touched the, the pool of oil. It's not mm -hmm. even funny. We had like drips all over it uh, by the end of the exhibition. Uh, but I, it was something that I wanted to resist. I wanted to highlight oil's transformative capacity as a way of focusing on this, on its insidiousness, on how, how it manages to penetrate. Even when we know it's bad for us, we can't quit it. Like uh, it really is an addiction. Yeah. You know, in all this talk of material, what's emerging is something, of course, which you set out to do in this exhibition, which is narrate an alternative and a far more complex history of the Gulf region's relationship to oil. But, you know, when you put the material as the protagonist of history, as opposed to putting the human as a protagonist of history, something profound also happens along the way. The exhibition is no longer just then, you know, a retelling of Arab history. It also becomes a powerful tool to rewrite art history and of understanding, of putting materiality at the center of the conversation. So I'm curious, is this something that, was this a goal when you, uh, for you in the course of making this exhibition when you started out? Or is it just an accumulation of your accumulated interests? Uh, I mean, a, a bit of both in some sense. I mean, it is part of my, uh, my ongoing interest to, uh, and engagement with what's ca called like speculative realism or new materialisms. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, again, very much driven by... Um, I'll just say it like an inability on my part to to kind of analyze things semiotically. Uh, my my own personal uh, kind of uh, biases uh, tend to be material. Like I can feel material. I can feel the weight. I'm very much drawn to sculpture over image. Um, and so when you know this this body of philosophy started emerging that kind of uh, ascribed agency to materiality. Uh, it was quite influential and quite transformative. And it was also a, a pathway in which to decenter the human, which of course as a post-colonial scholar is important, um, but then also as a way of kind of tapping into how dire our ecological circumstances are. Because uh, what new materialism does is it forces you to ascribe power to people outside of yourself or to, sorry, Freudian slip, to entities outside of yourself and also um, to recognize that you're part of an ecology. Uh, you know, for me, that it was quite transformative until I engaged with it. I had never thought about what it meant to be part of an ecology, actually. Um, so, 
there is that but then also as i started engaging with it with it also i mean there are certain benefits for push, pushing the blame onto the material you know the the you you're not criticizing any one particular person so uh, if from a very uh, strategic point of view curating a, a show about oil in the context of an oil producing country uh, that is uh, uh, it was it was you know it was nerve wracking and but one way of doing that was by uh, two, the, the two approaches that I kind of took consciously, one was through history. So you present the history. The other was by, by pushing it onto the material itself, you're not implicating any single person or entity in its effects. You're, you're saying that it's a quality of the material itself. And in some sense, that allows you a lot more latitude to, 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 to play with. I mean, the one kind of human entities that I did want to criticize and implicate uh, were the Western colonial presence, because it became clear to me as I started doing the research that um, the countries that are scapegoated now for being uh, evil in some sense because of the influence that oil wields over their economies, uh, the reason why they that, that this state of being exists now is because of colonial greed, Western colonial greed, and the Western reliance on oil. West, the West is still one of the major uh, markets for the oil that is generated from these parts of the world. Yeah. On that note, I'll just remind everyone, we have a, it's not a question, but it's a quick note from Uzma Rizvi here, who's just popped in to tell our viewers that the catalog for this show is available online for free. And she's put the link in the chat box if anybody wants to download it. Uh, so from this, uh, from, from the talk of the materiality of oil, Mutuza, I want to go into the notion also of time. And I want to quote you here because we're talking about the catalog. Uh, you know, when, when you're talking uh, in, in your essay about how the show is so much about these forgotten pasts and these colonial histories that you just mentioned, you say that it's, it's about, and I quote you, those moments of friction when oil's slippery flow was interrupted just long enough for the substance to emerge into view. And I think that's a really beautiful way to talk about, even as curators and makers of exhibitions or artworks, to really talk about the slippage of material through time and how, and how material, sorry, could you catch that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know how material passes through time, especially something like oil, which has this capacity for a you know, hyper accelerated transformation. It's almost a metamorphical quality that this material possesses. And again, I find myself going back to the idea of the archive, you know, and the emergence of an organic archive, like you said. So my question is to you, in, in the course of making this exhibition, how did you find these moments of friction, so to speak, you know, when the material emerges into view? Is, is your process very research heavy or, you know, at the risk of saying this the umpteenth time, do you let the material guide you? I mean, I let the material guide me, but in this particular case, maybe the material was not only oil itself, it was actually the artworks. So the moments of friction I mean, this is why I love what I do. Uh, artists teach me so much about not only aesthetics, but also history and politics. And, uh, and a lot of these moments of friction were identified by the artists themselves um, in some sense. Um, you know, it was just uh, uh, as I was trying to contextualize the work that I realized that the reason why these moments of friction are significant is because they allow this otherwise invisible entity to emerge into view. Um, and um, for me also, and in terms of time and in terms of uh, archives and, and, and maybe in terms of also momentum or movement uh, or drive, uh, another thing that was really important was um, the relationship that oil as, a, as, a, as an agential being has to both modernity and capitalism. So this kind of dialectic that I was setting up between magic and uh, and 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 lie, or between uh, between magic and 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 insidiousness, or um, between uh, fairy tale and lie, um, it's something that I feel like oil shares with both capitalism and with modernity. You know, so modernity had this promise and then it collapsed. Uh, capitalism has this 
kind of promise built into it, but then we all know that its inner workings are are, are rotten. And and so it was important for me to kind of like intertwine those three. That's why the the title of the exhibition, I mean, the title of the catalog essay is uh, called A Crude History of Modernity. So the idea was to really uh, re-engage with the history of modernity of the region, but not through a history of conflict or a history of politics. Uh, it was really an attempt to kind of tell an art history of the region. And that's why the, those, art, those historical works uh, by uh, uh, Latif Al-Ani and uh, Hushan Kizeshnia were important to include. There were a few other historical works that I, I, I discovered, but they were impossible to present within a, an exhibition. One was like an in situ um, uh, ceramic mural that I, I don't even know if still exists. Then there were a bunch of works that were held by a private collection that weren't accessible. And, and, and so, um, yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question exactly, but yeah, it is, it's all, it was the, the materiality. It was the materiality that kind of drove yeah. it. Yeah. I just want to take uh, one question from the audience here. Uh, Omkar Surve has asked, how was the local audience's response to the show? Were there any, uh, I, I think we were talking about this before as well, about how in March you really saw a boom and that's what he's asking. If were there any remarkable uh, critical responses you got? And I wanna use Omkar's question and sort of bring in, uh, you know, your personal relationship uh, with the ideas that you share with, with, the, with the ideas that are explored in the exhibition, you know. I know that uh, you have, your family has this uh, very fond memory of eating at Hardy's every week. And that's why that last work you showed us, that fast food paper bag is so relevant to you. Or, you know, this critique of yuppie culture, which, um, which we saw late, later in, in the works with the automobiles. So, you know, it's, it's for me an interesting way to look at your relationship with Dubai and then Dubai's relationship with the, with the larger global art world. And I think we've spoken about this before, about, you know, how there are shows that have been about uh, oil, which speak largely about um, the dangers of its excessive consumption. But that's because these shows come out of societies which share a relationship of consumption to oil, as opposed to your show, which uh, you know comes from a land which has a history of pro oil production. So, how do you think this show changes? You know, because Omkar's question really is about local audiences, but I also want to bring in the South Asian context here. And how do you think the show changes in the context of India or you know America, where you're based now? Uh, and, you know, how does the politics of extraction in these countries sort of complicate it? Do you see it being a traveling show in the future? I mean, of course, oil is something which is so pertinent uh, to economies across the world. So where do you see the show going in, in the future? I, I mean, I know you said you thought you laid it to rest, but uh, apparently not. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. Um... I mean, there were a lot of these uh, very context specific or site specific uh, uh, for lack of a better word or la lack of a better phrase, like inside jokes that I, and I wasn't sure how people, how they would go over. Um, for me, it was important because it, it localized the exhibition, which was important because part of the point of it was, was to start a conversation around something that is critical and ubiquitous but is basically not discussed much, right? For 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 obvious reasons, you know, a critique of uh, of the of the petroleum industry within uh, uh, an oil producing nation is a lot trickier than it is within an, uh, other part of uh, in another nation. So part, of, you know, I I did want to include work that was about the local that uh, provided openings for conversations. Um, and uh, a lot of these issues also, automobility and materialities, they're also prevalent within the social sphere of the Gulf, in the UAE, but also in the Gulf, you know. Um, the, uh, the kind of hyper-consumerism is something that people are very, very aware of. Um, and uh, uh, waste is, again, um, when I first started doing the research for this exhibition, like there wasn't uh, as much of a global movement against single-use plastic. But by the time the exhibition closed, uh, it had gotten pretty uh, pretty uh, widespread, um, in, including in the in in the Gulf. 
but uh, you know, the, like the, the the section of automobilities was important because uh, uh, people rely on cars there. You know, and what cars have done is it's created traffic jams. Like traffic jams are a, a part of everyday life in the in the UAE at least. Um, it's also produced uh, uh, high incidences of uh, of car accidents uh, and death and uh, road rage and things like that. But then it's also um, uh, produced uh, increased incidence of uh, of heart disease and uh, and diabetes and and uh, 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 other chronic diseases that are linked to kind of fast food culture in some sense. Um, so I wanted to bring all of these kind of issues up. And what was quite heartening to me was that you know the different parts of the exhibition spoke to different people. So these very local kind of in jokes in some sense. Uh, the, the the local people really responded well to that. So I had a lot of people come up to me who had either lived for in the Gulf for a while or uh, were born and raised there or live there right now, who were like, we loved that that aspect of it was represented. You know, so like, like with the fast food, it was a big favorite with like uh, school students. But then I had one, uh, one uh, an older woman who was in her 60s who said, yes, that took me back to when I lived here in the 80s and we used to go to, because Hardee's and and Kentucky Fried Chicken were the only places you could go out to eat. We used to go there as a family. And that was intentional. So that was amazing. But then, you know, the archival uh, uh, sections of things uh, really brought, resonated with, uh, with, uh, with older people who worked in these oil industries who felt like their histories had not been represented or narrated outside of their very close circles. And so there were people who worked at Aramco. There were people who worked in the oil industry. There were uh, diplomats and 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 uh, ministers who came to see this sh uh, show who were part of the oil industry, who really enjoyed seeing bits of their professional lives, uh, you know, represented to them within uh, an art exhibition. So, so it was, uh, you know, quite amazing for me. And then uh, of course the response from uh, the, the, the people who were visiting from outside was also really heartening. Like uh, uh, I think a lot of people were, uh, astounded that that sort of show happened in Dubai. I guess Dubai is so strongly associated with the, with the commercial side of things that people weren't expecting it. I, I had a few colleagues be like, this is like a proper museum level show. And I was like, uh, yeah, I think that's what we were trying to do. But um, um, one of the few critiques that I did get, one was, I mean, I'll just share the critiques because that's an easy way of showing where maybe the exhibition fell short and also maybe was successful. Um, was um, that it was historical, like it was too historical in some sense. And so in some sense, it was ignoring the present and the future. Uh, and it wasn't making uh, the focus of the exhibition uh, fossil fuels, ecological effects. But I feel like that's obvious and that has been done ad nauseum. And that was not what I was interested in. Also, I felt like that would close the conversation off in that local context very quickly. So for me, history provided a way in, just as materiality provided a way in, where a direct uh, critique of, uh, uh, of ecological uh, effects would not. Um, another uh, critique was that it was very pedagogical and it was very like information heavy. But again, in that context, in the UAE context, in the Gulf context, uh, people tend to shy away from uh, what I think an exhibition should do, which is you know, inform you and teach you things. So that was also quite intentional on my part. Um, so these two things, but now having said all of that, the, the, what made it really like resonate locally is I think what uh, I think would be hard for it to travel easily as well. Like it, by the end of the exhibition, I realized that in some sense, like all the exhibitions I do in the Gulf, it was like a love letter uh, to home. And, I don't know if a lot of these in jokes would uh, re would read in the same way abroad, and if they did, they would have to be repackaged or represented in a very ethnographic manner that I would be very uncomfortable with. So I think you know I would love for the show to travel. I think some of the works could travel quite easily. Um, I would also, uh, but I, I think it would have to be reformatted and rethought. And ideally, I would like for it to also uh, change maybe a little bit. There were a few works that I discovered late in the curatorial process that, uh, you know, because of that, I couldn't include in the show that I think are important to include. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's my kind of response. The, 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 you know, it was nerve wracking because it was a show that was critical about oil in a, in a 
in an oil producing country and and so there was a lot of anxiety and apprehension but i must uh, uh but it, but it went off really well people responded really really well to it um and i think people appreciated this kind of uh death touch where it was critical but not uh, confrontational um and also um i have to thank the 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 kind of vision and uh, and and support of uh, of both uh, you know the president of art jamil fadi jamil and the director of the jamil arts uh, of art jamil antonia carver uh, i mean i suggested it to them kind of as a, on a whim for an exhibition <laughs> down the line and they were like let's go with it for our inaugural show and i was like i was so nervous that you know it would uh, it would upset people but uh, uh, you know they 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 stuck by it they stuck with the decision and 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 you know we pulled it off and i i think it really set a good tone for the for the for the 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 what the center is trying to do uh, you know trying to uh, engage with critical discourse uh, in in a, in a space where it's often it, it can be hard uh, in terms of how it would travel i don't know actually this is a conversation where i would love to uh, um you know have further conversations about people in india the work that's about extractive industries in india uh, and about the eco ecology in india it seems much more related to uh, coal and to other um, um minerals and mining and uh, pollution um I, i'm i haven't done enough research to know what the role of oil in the, in in the in south asia is but um the response from south asia was great i mean if someone if an institution in south asia is interested uh, look me up and we can have a conversation uh, about it but uh, yeah i mean you know we were talking about this earlier that you know what is the relationship that say a country like india has to oil and i think one of the things that india does do is that it it provides storage capacity so for for the gulf especially they produce all of this oil and one of the things that one of the ways that india fits into this infrastructure and economy is that it provides facilities for uh for storage and refinement so that's an interesting maybe that needs to be explored and unpacked more yeah so on that note of being critical and not confrontational that you told us uh, i'll thank you murtaza for leaving us with this metaphor for the coarseness and the crudeness of history really and i'll now ask saloni to come in for her vote of thanks can i just jump in really quickly and I, i just i i completely missed the my thank you slide but uh, i did also in addition to fadi and uh, and antonia i do want to thank uh, nora razian and don ross and albert colombo who were part of uh, the uh, the team at jamil who helped me without whom the show would not have been possible at all and i want to also thank uh, and acknowledge studio suffer who helped design the exhibition itself all of its pedagogical materials and the catalog um and um i also do do want to thank all of the lenders uh one of the uh ideas behind the show was to really um activate and put in place uh, uh institutional uh cooperative networks between institutions across the region and so about a third of the works were drawn from local uh, uh collection uh so i want to thank all of those lenders i can't thank them by name and then i also just want to thank all the artists and their galleries as well for all their hard work and and thank you very much face 118 for the opportunity <laughs> thank you falguni and thank you so much murtaza uh, for that wonderful conversation you have not only opened a whole new pandora's box on the complexity of the oil industry which is something that affects our daily lives which we take for granted the narratives the economies and the ramifications of, and the positions and the nuances in these structures which we so take for granted today i hope we are able to reflect uh, on our relationship with fossil fuels and consumerism as you've highlighted and work towards a more sustainable future for the planet i also have to thank lekha podar for taking me to the show it was a second time around um when she wanted to revisit the videos at length i want to thank everyone at space 118 thank you and everyone who's watching this everyone who will watch this later in the future um thank you murtaza for taking us through the show in a very special manner and opening up to us we're back next sunday with yet another speaker and another show and incidentally another inaugural one we have nada raza who will be taking us through her experience 
of curating two of my favorite artists, uh, Zarina Hashmi and Shilpa Gupta for her launch, for the launch of the Ishara Art Foundation in Dubai in 2019. It was also an inaugural show and Nada's first show at Ishara. So stay tuned and see you next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>